Good morning. Um, thank you so much for being here on a Saturday morning. Okay, I'm pretty sure that you should you would prefer to be on bed or something like that. Um, so I really I'm really pleased to, to have you all here. So, really, really uh, quick question. <clears throat> so this talk is about uh, DevOps. It's about being on call. Um, <clears throat> does anyone here in this audience ever been on call during their work lives? There you go, one, two, three. Okay, nice, 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 very well, thank you so much. Okay, so <clears throat> the goal of this talk is pretty much, um, so this is a, um, a topic that I'm really, really passionate about. Um, so I, I decided that to kind of to pay a tribute to everyone that's, that is on call, that every now and then really deserves kind of to, to, to be noteworthy. Um, so I kind of created this talk exactly to explain all the pains uh, and the joys of being on call. And obviously, with a couple of twists, I'm going to explain the journey so far of implementing an on-call program. Cool. And obviously, last but not least, uh, the other kind of goal that I have for my talk is on-call really doesn't need to suck, okay? It can be amazing, okay? Cool. Um, so I was kind of already introduced. Uh, some of you already know me. Uh, so hi, my name is Pedro Torres, or here in Portugal, at Pedro Torres. Uh, so I speak with a kind of a Spanish accent. It is what it is. Um, I kind of try to define myself in just four sentences, and it's kind of a little bit hard, but it's more or less what I am. So I really believe I'm an impact-driven person, uh, pretty much because if I'm in a company and I don't make the difference, I really get bored, and that's not the person that I would like to be. I really like to be uncomfortable in trying to make an impact. Really love people, technology, and products. I don't see myself working in any sort of different area. Um, love Agile. I'm a really huge fan of Lean, of DevOps. That's why I'm here on stage today. Uh, and yeah, and I'm a, I've been a couple of experience running engineering teams. I'm a little bit old, uh, but it is what it is, right? I'm kind of hitting the mark of the 40s, and it's tough. <laughs> um, so cool, let's, let's jump into the call, into the talk, sorry. Um, and I really would like kind of to make sure that we are all on the same page, so I brought like the definition of what it is to be on call, okay? Just make sure that we are all aware of what I'm talking about. Um, so for that, I just kind of, I grabbed the, um, the Holy Bible of the English language, so the Oxford Living Dictionaries, um, so the definition that I saw online is of a person able to be contacted in order to provide a professional service if necessary, but not formally on duty. Okay, so this is like the definition. Um, and then they had like a couple of sentences that pretty much you can apply on call to those sentences. And I actually found them so interesting that I brought them here. Um, so the first one that they had was, so the team is on call 24 hours a day and he's trained in resuscitation techniques and how to use life-saving defibrillators, which is more or less what we do with our systems, right? So <laughs> we are almost like doctors. Um, if you work in a global organization, you might be on call 24 hours a day for troubleshooting or consulting, which sounds quite right. And last but not least, you have to get up in the middle of the night if you're on call, okay? And this actually means that you're lucky because you had the opportunity to go to bed, sometimes you don't. Um, so yeah, so this is the definition, so hopefully now everyone knows exactly what on-call means. Um, so how can you start the on-call program? So okay, you're, uh, you have a co your company, a startup, a corporate, whatever, you name it. How, do, how can you start? Um, pretty much you just need three things, okay? Um, you need shifts, okay, so you need to define the amount of time, the length of the time that the person will be on-call, okay? Which I usually call rotas, okay? So I have a background from the UK, in the UK we call them rotas, not shifts. Um, but I understood that in the US, they don't know what a rota is. You need people, okay? So we need, really need to have people on call, or like I like to call them, you need to, to have, those are what I call them, heroes. And this is my poor attempt of creating the Batman logo. Apologies for that. Um, and obviously, last but not least, you need systems, okay? Hopefully, the critical ones, because the thing is, if you want to, so if you need to take someone out of bed to help out on any sort of system, might as well be an important one, because if it is something that can actually wait for the very next day, it, should, it probably shouldn't be on call, okay? And, and your developers or your system administrators or whatever who is on call really deserve some rest, otherwise it will be a little bit complicated. Um, <clears throat> and why? So why do we need an on-call program? So what's in it for us as a company uh, or even as an engineer? Uh, pretty much because of five things, okay? So the first one is because you care about your customers, okay? So they deserve the best possible service, and in order for you to do that, you really need to make sure that you have on-call coverage. Um, because you care about your, prod uh, your production systems, okay, I think that back in the past, uh, a software engineer would just pretty much kind of develop systems and that was it. Uh, today, it should be much more than that, okay? You shouldn't just code, you shouldn't kind of 
take full ownership of your system. You should kind of run it, develop, run it, and kind of deploy it and look after it in production. You should have a program because you care about your engineers and you want to make sure that they have the resources, the tools, the procedures in order to be successful doing on-call. Because you care about your company, okay? Because I'm really, really pretty sure that if you have a problem, an outage, and no one looks after that, probably you need to go to LinkedIn on the very next day because your company will close or lose your customers, right? And finally, because you care about your job. Okay, so these are the five reasons that I believe that you should have an on-call program. Cool, so I'm going now to talk a little bit more about the journey that we faced so far on the on-call program. So show of hands, did anyone here at some time in their lives played Age of Empires? Yes. Thank you for that. Cool, so let's kind of play a game here, okay? So let's play kind of Age of Empires. It's going to be lousy, but just, just, just bear with me on this. <laughs> um, so cool. Let's play that game. I don't know how, how you familiar were or if you actually remember about the game. When you started the game, you needed to choose the civilization that you were going to play with. Um, so I brought here the four that you would, so the kind of, you know, you had like some sort of drill down, but it would all get boiled down to four of them. So Greek, Mesopotamian, Egyptian, and Asian. And I know it's a Saturday morning, and that, but I kid you not, please choose the civilization that you're going to play with through the rest of the presentation, okay? You don't need to tell the rest, okay? Just kind of keep it to yourself, but this is going to be really important because the talk will change completely, taking consideration the civilization that you're going to choose, okay? So this is like as personal as this can be. <laughs> um, cool, so let's start the game. The game starts on the Stone Age, okay? It's the very, very beginning. And does anyone, oh, and by the way, sorry for the resolution, but you know, the, the game is quite old. <laughs> it was the best images that I got. Does anyone actually remember the name of this building on the game? Town center, I heard it. Yes, town center, exactly, town center. And for you to actually to build a town center, it would cost you, town center, 200 wood, okay? It would be the resources to build a town center. So we just built our town center, we are in Stone Age, so it's the very beginning of our journey. And to be entirely honest, when we started doing the on-call program, which was quite, quite, quite a while ago, everyone was on-call, okay? We didn't have any sort of program. People were just kind of, you know, everyone was available. Even our CEO would be on call and would jump on Slack and try to help. It was pretty much what it was, right? It's the Stone Age, the very beginning. And again, and this is just pretty much to prove you that for you to have an on-call program, nothing needs to be perfect. You really just need to make sure that you start, you get the ball rolling, and you make sure that you get some sort of coverage. Okay, so this is Stone Age. Now it starts to get more interesting. Tool Age, okay? And for the tool age, now things get a little bit more sophisticated, right? Even our top center now has some stones and some, I don't know, a well or whatever this is. Okay, now we are getting to get a little bit more sophisticated. So that, to talk to us, would be pretty much, so we had an operations team, okay? So we created that, which we kind of called it DevOps team, which I know it's a huge and deep pattern. Okay, we can, we can discuss that uh, later today. Um, and we had DevOps engineers too, okay? And those were the people that were, be, that were on call. Okay, it was DevOps engineers, it was kind of, almost kind of sysadmins, and they were the guys that would look after the, um, the system. But one thing that was actually very interesting was that, so the idea of you being a long call, it was never mandatory, okay? So it would be pretty much optional, it's purely voluntary. If you say, hey, I want to be on call, that would be fine. If you don't want to go to be on call, that would be fine too. So you would never be problems because of that. And so we only had two engineers, okay? I'm talking about almost a team of 80, and we only had two people be on call back then. Uh, we had three days road out, okay. So that was the kind of the def definition that we had. And to be entirely honest, I think that a rota like this, so a shift, uh, it's a huge mistake. Pretty much because if you only have like three days, uh, if let's say you're grabbing the weekend, that really sucks, right? So if you're in the middle of the week, that's fine, right? You almost are just on call during the night. But if you grab like Saturday and Sunday, then definitely the, the rotors are not exactly the same, and, they, in the, and that can actually lead to some unfairness with, in the process. Uh, back then, to be entirely honest, everyone was on Slack anyway, in the middle of the night, right? Because everybody loves computer games, so everyone was kind of playing some League of Legends or something like that. Um, so every time we had some, some problems, we would just go to Slack and say, hey, can someone help out? And then all of a sudden, like 20 people would jump in, okay? It was what it was, but it worked, okay? To be entirely honest, it worked. Um, so we decided for a tool, okay, kind of to generate all the, uh, the alarmistic. Um, so we look, uh, after we look to Victor Ops, uh, PagerDuty, and Ops Genie, okay? It was like the three ones that we kind of evaluated. Um, back then, Victor Ops seemed quite, uh, quite decent. It was not that expensive. It still works for us, so it was a good choice. And 
I kid you not, we had like tons and tons of alarms back then, okay, because pretty much we just create alarms for everything. Um, and obviously that, that's a huge problem because if you have like a system that is constantly triggering alarms, you get to a point of the, the, the false positives or what I usually call the broken window theory, right? Because if you have someone that is, something that is constantly triggering an alarm, well, all of a sudden no one cares, right? Because it's just another alarm, probably it's nothing. Oh, and then obviously leads to very interesting problems. We didn't track our mean time to acknowledge at all, okay? And our mean time to recover, we didn't track it too, okay? So it probably would take like seven days or so to actually to close an incident, it was crazy. And to be honest, all systems were on call. Because back then what we decided to do was, so we grabbed all our systems and say, hey, so tell us your stakeholders, all these stakeholders, what's more important to you? And our stakeholders say, hey, everything's important. And like, oh shit, okay. Uh, so all of a sudden, everything was, was important and everything was on call. Um, so we didn't got any sort of compensation back then, okay? Just pats in the backs and hugs, okay? It was what it was, it was a startup. Um, and we had also alarms in staging environments, okay? And this is just like, it's a big, big no-no, okay? It's even like, no. And it's terrible, right? You don't want to actually wake up in the middle of the night with an alarm from a development environment or something like that. Um, obviously, these sort of situations, this scenario that I'm telling you about, led to fatigue, to burnout of, of our people, which obviously is terrible, because that obviously tends to lead to churn, because when you get tired, you leave the company, it is what it is, right? But at least, at least back then, okay, we already decided to do blameless postmortems. I don't know how familiar you are with blameless postmortems, but pretty much you kind of just kind of create a full uh, description of an incident, and you just focus on what's happened, on the facts, and on the systems, and the things that went wrong, without saying, hey, engineer A did this, and he was his blame, and the other engineer jumped into the incident later, and that's why A, B, and C. So it was just pretty much blameless, okay? It's actually uh, something that Google started a couple of years ago, and it works pretty well. Um, so these were our stats back then. Not so cool, to be honest, okay? So we had tons of alarms being triggered. Our mean time to acknowledge was more than seven minutes, okay? So that's just crazy. Uh, have some, an incident where uh, we do to take uh, around seven minutes to say, hey, I'm here to resolve it. Um, we wrote a couple of postmortems, okay? Um, so as you can see, much less than the, 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 the incidents that we had, but although we tried to have some decent uptime, okay? So it was not that bad. Now, did you chose your civilization, you start to see your town hall take consideration what you chose, okay? So you have the Egyptian, the Greek, everything over there, so stick to your town center, please. Bronze Age. Um, so Bronze Age was pretty much the previous age where we are today. So we created the, an SRE team, okay, and they only covered their own rota, okay? So this was like a huge, huge transition in the company, and why? Because we decided that software engineers should be on call, okay? So software engineers, we strongly believe they are not in the company just to develop, just to develop software, they are there to maintain the system they create. And that actually leads to very interesting reactions and behaviors, okay? Because I kid you not, if I'm a software engineer, and if I'm going to be on call on that weekend, I'm pretty sure I'm not going to push something to production on a Friday at 6 p.m., okay? But if I was not the person, eh, might not be that bad, okay? So that, that led to actually to very interesting behaviors. Um, so just like I told you, so development teams starting to have rotas, okay? And that was actually very interesting too. And we decided to have just one engineer per rota, okay? So, for instance, right now we have four people on call taking into consideration the rotas they, are, they, they grabbed. Um, so yes, so I already spoke about this, engineers on call, eating your own dog food, good behavior. Um, so we moved actually from two to 20. Uh, even still being a voluntary uh, program, everyone kind of, everyone in brackets obviously, um, joined the program, which was cool. People actually grabbed this, kind of felt the ownership of maintaining their systems in production and actually what was a very pleas uh, pleasant surprise. Um, in terms of tools, Back then, what we decided was, okay, let's make sure that we got simple stuff. So we just gave like one hotspot per, per shift, per rota. Um, people have smartphones, so they installed the, the VictorOps application. Um, already everyone has its own laptop anyway, so simple as this. Um, we moved from three days to a full week, okay? Again, because of fairness, so you used to have like a, a length of seven days being on call. Um, and the rotas started and ended on Tuesdays. And you say, why Tuesdays? Because we ended and started the sprints at the exact that, that, that day. So we kind of ended the sprint, started the sprint, started the new rota. It kind of made sense for us. Um, and yes, so because of all systems being on call, we decided to actually to 
change, our strategy is to say, okay, so if no one can decide which or the system that should be on call, let's us make a proposal for our stakeholders. And they kind of say, hey, so what's really, really important to you? What can't miss? So hey, this is our proposal for our systems to be on call, and it was kind of accepted, which is obviously much better to have a, a tailored um, list of the systems instead of kind of having just everything. Um, also one thing that is very important, so we created playbooks, and I don't know how familiar you are with playbooks, but pretty much playbooks is like kind of, you know, uh, like almost like a manual of what you need to do, taking into consideration the symptom or a problem that might be in production, okay? Saying, hey, if you're experiencing this, do that. If the problem is this, do that, okay? So we created this so that anyone, oops. Oh, nice, <laughs> thank you. Uh, so that anyone could be on call regardless of knowing the system or not, okay? Again, because it, for you to be on call, you're not going to code in the middle of the night. You really just like, need to make sure that the system gets back up and running. And another thing that we decided was actually to create this uh, role of the incident commander, and what's this? Uh, since we had more than one, one guy on call, we would really need to make sure that when someone jumps into the incident, we decide which one is the commander, and the commander kind of coordinates the efforts of solving the incident. Otherwise, we would just have like more than one guy or one person doing exactly the same thing, then we would probably not understand exactly the behaviors that we were experiencing in production. So we decided that it would make sense actually to kind of to create this figure. Also very important, uh, so the, uh, the, one of the duties of the incident commander is actually to kind of to make sure that the company is aware of what's happening. So let's say every five minutes or so, we go to a public channel on Slack saying, hey, the on-call team is looking into this, this is a progress that we have, we believe that we'll solve the problem in X amount of minutes or anytime soon, something like that, okay? Because again, remember the stakeholders are suffering too, waiting to tell something to the customers. Something that was pretty much amazing was we created a, a weekly fire drill. Um, so Google calls it a wheel of, of misfortune, and pretty much this is nothing more than you just grab one incident that you had in the past, and you just kind of try to recreate it on the controlled environment. So say, hey, we had a problem with our infrastructure because this server went down. Okay, cool, so let's kind of recreate the problem and see if, if actually our playbooks are up to date and will solve the situation. So this, just like I told you, is twofold. Not only we can validate that our playbooks are updated, but also that one engineer could actually solve the problem, right? Because if you're on call, you really need to make sure that you're aware and you're capable of solving stuff. Um, we finally decided to actually to pay for people for doing that, okay? Obviously, it wouldn't make any sense to, to continue without that, and that was actually something that was, I was very pleased. Um, so the problem that I told you about the alarms a couple of minutes ago, so we decided to actually to do something about that too. So we fine tuned the alarms and making sure that the program will be a success. So every time we have an alarm triggered, it really needs to be for a valid reason. So we actually kind of, you know, we fine tuned the alarms, we redefined thresholds. We, we, we decided that the time to acknowledge an incident would be five minutes. It's more than fine, I guess. So if you're taking a shower or so, you have five minutes to, to get out and kind of to acknowledge something. Um, and also very important, so we distinguish alarms from notifications, okay? So an alarm is something that you really need to kind of to jump into that. A notification is pretty much something that can wait for the, very ne for the next day. Because again, you really need to make sure that you have valid reasons to get out of bed in the middle of the night. So also, we removed uh, alarms in staging, okay? So that was also a very interesting progress, okay? So it was like, yay! Um, and yes, and just like I told you before, still the program is volunteer based, which is something that is very, very powerful. So people don't, they are not obliged, they don't think that they need to be on call. It's just kind of, if you believe that you should keep your system and maintaining it, it's fine. Um, one pattern that we saw was actually that we had more than, let's say the same person would cover more than one rota. Again, because we had playbooks, so we now saw that sort of behaviors. Um, but also one thing that is very important is make sure that we don't have people on call more than one week. Because if you are on call, let's say, two or three weeks in a row, that's quite hard, okay? So we would make sure that people wouldn't get two shifts. Um, and also one thing that we, we believed was, <clears throat> one thing that is always very hard to manage is vacations, and you know, and let's say, hey, I need to play football with my friends, what can I do about it? And we actually kind of created a self-management system where obviously with some facilitation, if I need to be on vacations next week and I would be on call, I just kind of change the days with the next engineer that would be on call, okay? So it's not something that say, hey, now I need to, to, to change my vacations, not at all. 
is something that people can actually work very well with that. Um, another thing that we did, <coughs> and that's this one that was actually very, very powerful, and it has a weird name that I'm going to explain, don't worry, it's the Acasius list, okay? So this, is, uh, this has a story um, behind this. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, there is a person th that works at Google in Switzerland uh, that is Acasio Cruz, so he's Portuguese. Um, and I kind of, I approached him and say, hey, Acasio, uh, when are you coming to Portugal for vacations or so? And he said, hey, actually, I'm going to be in Portugal in the, in the following month. And I said, great, do you want to actually to come here to talk this and give like a talk about SRE and kind of help us out here? <clears throat> and obviously he accepted, uh, he's like a great person. And when we asked him for a couple of advices, he said, hey, you really should have a list, a non-call non list. And then we said, okay, so what's that? He said, so <clears throat> pretty much any engineer that would be on call, we need to check on all the items of that list. And if the person would check everything, it means that the person would be ready to be on call. This is, sounds pretty simple and obvious, but for us it was a kind of, wow, okay, that's interesting. Uh, and because of that, obviously, we decided to call the list the Cassius list, which made some sense, and we would pay the tribute for the person that had the idea. Uh, <clears throat> When you join the program, another thing that we decided that, it, that made sense is being on call, I don't know how aware you are of that, it, might, it can be pretty scary, right? Because so in the middle of the night, you get, you get paged. Uh, probably there is not a lot of people to help you. The, the company expects you to solve the problem regardless of what the problem is. You probably don't have a clue what's happening. Um, so it tends to be scary. So one thing that we decided to do was, okay, so every time you have a new person on the program, you shadow another engineer. So, Instead of you being on your own, you would just pretty much kind of shadow someone that would be on call, and I, as kind of the person that would be shadowing, I would just kind of see the person acting during the incident, and after a couple of weeks, and as soon as I get comfortable, I would then start being on call without kind of shadowing. Um, one thing that we observed, also, and this one is really, really important, was that we didn't have enough time to work on the resiliency of our systems, um, because, well, all companies have very interesting and aggressive roadmaps. We always want to deliver more, and, and I kid you not, right? It, it's always very hard to kind of to negotiate with, with the product backlog. It's, should I create a feature? Should I look into the resiliency or the latency of a system or so? Uh, it's always hard, uh, and we actually understood that we got some incidents, we created a blameless postmortem, we had some action items, but we didn't have enough time to actually tackle those action items, and that was something that definitely would need to change. Um, we created some on-call procedures, okay? Um, so, you know, kind of making some processes like updating the company status page, saying that we had any problem in production, making sure that the stakeholders would be informed, because again, imagine yourself, you're super under stress, um, everyone's kind of trying to understand what's happening, and if you don't update every now and then the company of what's, what's wrong, you're probably going to get like five or six messages from very different people, and all of a sudden you're just kind of responding to everyone instead of solving the incident, so it's really important to make sure that everyone's informed of what's happening. Um, and yes, and that was exactly the moment that we actually had official 24-7, 365 uh, coverage, and this is something that is really important, because as soon as you have a product that can be used in any time of the day throughout the entire year, it's, it's crucial for you to make sure that you have coverage for your, for your customers' sake. Um, and also something that was, I was really proud of that, that was <clears throat> since the program was completely volunteer, um, it was, would never be fair to say that, hey, because that engineer is on call, he's going to get a better performance review than the person that is not. So it was something that was pretty much like two very different streams, so you're on call, that's fine, thank you so much for that. You have, you have my eternal gratitude, but that won't ever affect the performance that you have throughout the year, so that it, it, it would not be fair. Um, and another interesting thing, uh, at least here at TalkDesk, is that although we have six, six offices, okay, uh, three of them uh, uh, abroad, uh, we only have software engineers here in Portugal. So instead of, for instance, like Google, that uses a, a follow the sun strategy, say, okay, so, we are working uh, here in Portugal time zone. Then in San Francisco, we have more engineers working in their time zone. And pretty much you always have someone from software engineer awake uh, and working. Uh, it, here is not the fact, it's not the situation. So we just do the coverage of on-call here in Portugal and not in any other office. Um, P0, okay, no one likes them. Uh, thank God we don't, we don't have a P0 uh, long ago. Uh, but then, to be entirely honest, we just, everyone jumped into the incident. So, like, forget about procedures, it's like all hands on deck. Uh, at least the last one was. Um, but yes, thank God we didn't experience a lot of those. Um, and another thing that was actually quite handy 
is that no matter how fine-tuned your alarms are, there is always some, t some need that might uh, arise of saying, hey, I really need to call the on-call engineer. Why? Because I have a customer that is complaining about some weird behavior. And probably don't have the alarm for that. Uh, so what we did was actually we grabbed Zapier and Slack. We just kind of integrated. So every now that I want to actually to call the team, I just write a message on Slack, and it will trigger uh, the Victor Ops, and the team will get paged. OK? And this is actually pretty useful. Um, so from that stage, um, now some cool stats, OK? So as you can see with the changes that we did, so we got a very interesting reduction of alarms. Um, obviously now we, we took the MTTA and MTTR tracking quite seriously, as you can see. We start writing much more postmortems, and obviously that also reflected on our uptime, okay? So it was kind of telling us that we were on the right track with this. And now finally, where we are today. So we are almost ending the game, so now it's the Iron Age. Um, look to your lovely town center, it's the last time you're going to see it. Um, what did, what, where, where we are today? Um, so today we rebranded our program, okay? Uh, so we stopped calling it on-call program and we started calling it Vanguard program, okay? Uh, and huge, huge thanks to Raul, uh, it's our CTO that had the idea, uh, and actually he's giving a talk today around 5 p.m. or so, you should listen to that talk, he's a great person. But also to Bruno, it was the person that kind of, you know, that made uh, this possible Sean and Joel, and you'll see what I'm talking about in a couple of minutes, if the presentation allows. There you go. Um, and yeah, so what did we do uh, with this? So we kind of created, like, re rebranding the, the program, and we just kind of printed these posters, and we just kind of put them on walls, hanging on the walls, kind of with a date saying something is going to happen on this date throughout the offices, and then obviously started to generate some, interesting, some interest from our engineers, saying, hey, what's going to happen? What's this of the Vanguard? What's, what's, the, what's about with this poster? Uh, and said, hey, cool, you're, you're going to find out in a couple of days. This was actually interesting, because a lot of people in the office started talking about this. Um, and then all of a sudden, we created the Vanguard program, and if the gods of PowerPoint will be successful, I'm going to play a video to you, okay? I don't know if this is going to work, or if this has sound, hopefully it will have. Pretty cool, huh? <laughs> so yeah, so this was what we decided to do. Uh, again, on-call really doesn't need to suck, so we decided to do some sort of gamification of this. Uh, and obviously, we have a lot of people that are super enthusiastic about this and kind of create all of that. Um, so now in this new program, uh, you start as a ghost. So this is pretty much kind of the badge of being a ghost. As soon as you stop being a ghost and stop shattering, you decide your faction. Okay, so you can join central, main. Uh, platform or SRE, okay, it's really up to you to decide in which clan you're going to, to work for. Um, now we have kind of, you know, like the banner with the name of the player or the engineer in this case, the level, okay. Um, you have like the badges that you now achieve because every time you kind of, you go jump into an incident or you tackle a, uh, like something from the, our product backlog, you have something over there. Um, there you go, so these are like a, a close up of the badges. Um, you have scores and stuff, okay. Um, these are like the rank progress that, you, that we now have. Uh, even Victor Ops got a new cool image. I don't know if you know the logo, but this actually looks way too way cooler. Um, we kind of create this sort of stuff too. Uh, and even uh, Slack now has a new image, okay? So there you go. We just got a little bit excited with this, <laughs> I confess. Uh, and yes, and we says, hey, so speak with the people, the guardians, and join the program, okay? Um, so this didn't stop here, so we said, hey, it would be amazing if you had some swag about this stuff. So we kind of created, you know, like coffee mugs, stickers. We, we didn't have this like envelopes I never saw in my life, but okay, every time you join the program, you get all of this delivered to your, to your desk. Um, so this is like the veteran stickers, so as, as you stay for an amount of time, you, you're, you get this sort of reward. There you go, the envelopes that I've just talked about, this was just, just crazy. Um, so yeah, so we kind of just decided to grab gamification 
and say, okay, this really needs to be something special. Again, being on call is not, it's, it's quite tough, so let's make sure that people at least enjoy themselves. Um, one thing that we kind of decided that it was really important was, so now the on-call engineers can actually be out of the sprints, so they can actually work on the resiliency of the systems. So this was probably my, like the hugest change that we did, besides obviously the gamification was, okay, so if you're on-call, instead of working on the product, you can actually work on the systems throughout that week and no one will bother you. Um, and yes, and I, although we are quite in the beginning of this, we start to see some sort of improvements, and I, I know that um, correlation is not causation, but the, the fact is that we, we have even more impressive stats than we had before, uh, and things are going quite well. Um, so yes, this is almost like the end of the game, okay? So I don't know if you remember, usually for you to, end the, to, end, to win the game, we need to time to slaughter all the, all the characters of the other players, so you are victorious. So here are some final thoughts I really would like to give to you before you leave. Um, so the first one is on call really doesn't need to suck, okay? It's hard, uh, it's a very noble uh, ask or task to be, to, for people to do, but it really doesn't need to suck. Um, you just need to be fair, honest, and respectful with everyone, okay? Because again, they are doing us a favor. Don't, don't believe that just because you're paying someone to be on call, that it's fine because it's not, okay? You really should kind of be, you should cherish the person that are doing that. Um, yeah, exactly what I said, okay? It's really important. Don't, don't think just because you're paying someone money to get out of bed, that's, that's it, because it's not. Um, don't aim for perfection, okay? We evolved our on-call program quite a lot, as you saw. Um, you know, just start with, with what you have um, and then evolve it, kind of improve it as you go. Don't wait for perfection to launch your on-call program, otherwise you'll probably never get something done. Um, I read this book, okay? So this book is like a great, great inspiration for you to create an SRE team, to create an on-call program. It's the Google SRE book. It's super hard to read, okay? It's more than 500 pages. I read them all. Uh, it's tough. I recommend it, but grab some coffee because you're going to need it. Uh, <laughs> Um, another thing that is super cool is uh, the hashtag that we have on Twitter. Okay, so every time someone gets on call, if you take your, a selfie of yourself while you're on call and put this hashtag, people will talk to you on Twitter and support you. Okay, so it's as crazy as it is. You can actually check that out. Um, so this one is actually very, this means a lot to me. Uh, burnout is a real thing. Don't believe that burnout is just for the other people or just it happens on other companies. Uh, really value this. Uh, people get tired. Uh, and when we are tired, we may usually tend to make bad decisions. Um, so take this very, very, very seriously. Um, tune those alarms, okay? Uh, no one will, get, will take this seriously if you just have like staging alarms like we did or just kind of, you know, like system trigger alarms every, uh, all the time. Don't make rush decisions because you're getting too many alarms, okay? Because back then, we, it was quite tempting to say, hey, let's just shut down this alarm because this is kind of triggering too much. Don't do that sort of stuff because you're going to regret it later. We learned the hard way. <laughs> um, take advantage of business hours to tackle problems. Uh, remember one thing, wh while you're on call, you're just like one person trying to solve a problem. If it is during the day, you have like 200 engineers or 50 engineers that can actually help out and solve problems so that you can actually have a, a decent night. Being on call doesn't mean that you need to save the world. Uh, so we don't really need Rambos or people that are just kind of adrenaline seekers saying, hey, I'm on call and I'm going to solve all the problems. Stick to the playbooks, that's why we created them. I know it's, it's fun to kind of to be on all this sort of adrenaline and being completely rushed. Uh, but the thing is kind of just play safe. Everything that you do can impact your customers because you're playing with, playing in, with production. Um, every time you have an incident, don't hesitate to jump into a video call. Okay, it's really important to make sure that everyone that is in the incident, we are seeing ourselves, we are discussing problems. Slack is not enough, that's the problem. Async communication, it's never enough. Um, don't forget to keep the stakeholders in the loop, just like I told you, everyone's suffering from the sidelines, might as well just keep them updated instead of them kind of asking you every now and then what's happening. Um, action items on blameless postmortem should be tracked and making sure that they are executed, because again, if you write a postmortem with what happened, but at the very end of the day, you don't do anything about it, so why are you writing postmortems, okay? And um, don't fall into the wishful, wishful thinking game. Um, every now and then, you probably see some problem and you're going to blame the network, right? Because the network fails and that's fine. It doesn't defend itself, so you can say, hey, no, it's not my problem. Uh, but kind of be pessimistic. If you have a problem, just really dive deep into it. And if you believe that's not your fault, in brackets, 
be ready to prove that. Otherwise, you really shouldn't stop searching for the root cause. Um, always write postmortems, okay? And bear in mind that sooner or later, with the success of your company and the more demanding customers, they will demand for public postmortems, okay? Google had an outage a couple of weeks ago and they had a public postmortem to tell everyone what happened. That was actually pretty cool. And that's it. Thank you so much. So does anyone have any questions? One over there. Um, so my question is, if you want to be on call and you want to be effective, usually you need some tooling, documentation, that sort of thing. Yep. Uh, and it takes time to develop that. How do you factor that into the regular development cycle to make sure that people take the time to develop effective tooling? We, we put that on the, thank you for that quick question. We put that on the, it's pretty much product uh, backlog items. Okay, so we kind of negotiate that with the, our product owner saying, hey, so we are going to ship this stuff into production. And usually the first time that you're actually going to deploy that system into production, if, it's going, if it is expected for the system to be on call, then the current on call team is going to have like a, some sort of meeting with you saying, hey, so now you're going to deploy your system, where are the playbooks? Show me the alarms, show me the logging. So if I have an issue, where do I need to look? Uh, all of that is kind of triaged, and then if by some reason, let's say, ah, actually, I don't have that stuff. Okay, so that's fine. Just kind of go to back to your sprint, make sure that you have room for that, and then come back to us, and as soon as everything kind of checks, then it is in, in, in on call. Awesome. Cool, thank you. Any more questions? Yes, the gentleman over there. So how long did it take you to go to, from Stone Age to Iron oh, Age? Yeah, nice one, cool yeah. To, mean, to know. Yeah. Um, so the Stone Age, I was not even in the company. So I would probably say that Stone Age was like from 2013 to 2015. Okay, it was pretty much like two years or so. Uh, when I arrived to the, to the, to the Tool Age, um, it was back in 2016. So I would say that, so this is what we have today. The previous age, the one that it was starting to get a little bit more sophisticated, it was more or less like one year. Um, so the thing was, until we actually kind of took this seriously, I would say that as soon as we kind of grabbed this, it was one year to evolve from a decent, decent program to gamification. Thank you. Anyone else? Going one, last, there you go. <laughs> Since you Yellow. gamified the on-call, mm -hmm. don't you worry that engineers might spread errors <laughs> on purpose to score more points? This is the second time that people ask me that. <clears throat> so I, that never occurred to me, to be entirely honest. Um, so we, don't, we, we try not to reward because of that. Usually the, um, the, the more points that you can get is from the items on the product backlog and not pretty much, so kind of tasks when you get out of the sprint. Uh, so we try not to kind of reward you just because you jumped into the incident. Uh, but yeah, hopefully I, we don't see that sort of stuff, but uh, yeah, it's the second time when someone asked me about that, so I'm going to take that a little bit more seriously <laughs> from now on.